Morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Awesome. Cool. That's some of the enthusiasm I'm looking for. I am really excited. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I've got to know most of you, um, but me and my wife moved here about 10 months ago to be a part of this incredible community, and about prior to that, we were a part of the team that helped plant Reverse Church in Pontiac, which eventually became God's House Pontiac, and DJ, who I'd known for nearly 20 years, kept calling me like, dude, the stuff going on here is just awesome, and so we're like... Yeah, but it's in Indiana. Are we going to move there? And we came, and then six months later, we bought a house, and we now live here. And we're very happy to be here. So it's, it's a cool thing. And this morning, I'm excited because I love teaching. And the cooler thing is still is because we haven't started into a series yet, I can teach whatever I want this morning which is great fun because now I actually get to draw from exactly what God's been working with me on over the last couple weeks, which honestly is my favorite way to do it because it's still raw and I'm still discovering it. So everything I'm about to talk about, let me just preface and say it, I'm still working through it. Like as I talk about it, you're like, man, I bet you he's a rock star at this. I'm not. I'm still struggling with it and trying to figure it all out. And that's why I'm excited to talk about it with here because when we learn new things, we deal with it as a community, don't we? And we learn as a community. We journey in new directions as a community. And this is new to me. Some of you might be out there and be like, yeah, this is just old school stuff. We get it. But for me, I'm working through it. So what we're going to talk about this morning is how do we bring heaven to earth? How do we actually experience everything God has for us in his kingdom here? And we know that's important. And we know it's one of our mandates because when his disciples come to him and say, teach us how to pray, he gives them the Lord's Prayer, right? We all know it, and it starts, Our Father, which art in heaven, holy is your name, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our mandate is to bring heaven to earth. So we're going to talk about is how we do that, what's our expectation, and what are we looking for in that. So we're going to jump into it, and in order to do that, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 28. We're going to start with verse 10. Before I go into it, I'll give you just a little background of where we're jumping into. This is the story of Jacob. And he's the brother of Esau, son of Isaac, and he has just betrayed his brother twice. Very successfully, I might add. He stole his birthright, and he had just recently deceived his father, who was aging and blind, into thinking he was his brother in order to steal the birthright. His brother was much more capable at violence in causing harm to other people than Jacob was, so he took off. So this is Jacob in the wilderness, on the run for his life, and this is the experience he has. Starting with verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord your God, the father of Abraham and Isaac, and I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. All the people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you will go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Okay, kind of a little departure here. That verse has been like wrecking me every time I read it. Because how often are we so focused on one situation and one idea, like, God, come here, right here to this moment, because I need your attention right here on this relationship, this idea, this cause, this thing, and God, you're not showing up. But if we look up, we might have a moment like, wow, surely God is in this place, and I'm not aware of it. So kind of a little departure, but back to what we're talking about. I just like that, and I've been getting a lot of it, so I'm sharing it with you. All right, so right back to it. He said, surely the Lord was in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though it used to be called Luz. Now, Bethel is a very popular church In Redding, California, there's also a Bethel church just down the street. But what Bethel actually means is the house of God. Or for today, in all intents and purposes, we can say God's house. Fun little coincidence, right? 
but it means the house of God. And this is really cool because it's actually the first mention in all of scripture about the house of God, a dwelling place for God. And the interesting thing is, is there's no building, there's no structure, which we're cool with because we're always taught like, of course, the house of God isn't the building, it's just a tool. The house of God is the people of God, us collecting together as the church. But the funny thing about this story and this incident is there's no people here either. There's just a guy who seriously blew it and is running for his life, and he slept on a rock. And I don't know if it caused this vision or what, but we'll say it didn't. This was God. Um, There was no building, but this passage is talking about the house of God. So let's kind of break it down in what he said and how he described what God's house was. It says in verse 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gateway of heaven. So the house of God is a gateway to heaven. And if we break it down, what is a gate? We're like, are we going this elementary seriously? But follow me here just for a second. A gateway is a separation from one space to another, right? A lot of you guys may have a gateway in your houses. Actually, I'm going to vent for a second here. The only gate I currently now have in a house is a puppy gate. And it's super hoopty rig. Like, seriously. Me and my wife, we just went on vacation to celebrate, like, our fourth wedding anniversary. It was great and awesome, but since we got married, there has been this whole, like, we should get a dog. It'd be amazing. I'm like, no, that sounds awful. Like, really and truly, it really sounds terrible. But after four years, I'm realizing I need to love my wife exceptionally well, so we got a dog. And we bring this dog home, and honestly, I don't know what they did with him at the kennel. He's 10 weeks old, but he never actually peed in the house. Like, ever. Like, our main floor is mostly hardwood, and he just didn't pee on it. However, he was kind of afraid of our back hallway that led to our bedroom and bathroom, and that area was carpet, and he got over his fear of going into that hallway, and he stepped onto the carpet and peed. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is everything I had hoped would never happen in my life. And... My wife consoled me, and she said, this is normal, it's great, this is preparing us for kids, which I think is the dumbest thing in the world. (laughs) Like, there's no correlation between children and puppies. I mean, like, children have a purpose, they grow up and can do incredible things in the world. Once he stops peeing on the carpet, that's the peak of his evolution. (laughs) Really and truly. But anyway, I digress. So, she's like, well, just go get a baby gate. Just go get a baby gate so he doesn't go back there. I'm like, but he's not a real baby. Like I said, I'm kind of working through some stuff right here with you guys right now. And she's like, no, seriously, it'll help. I'm like, I'm not spending money on a baby gate for a stupid dog. Like, I'm just not going to do that. So I got our dining room chairs and put them in front of this walkway and put some cardboard boxes around it, which is not fun to go through. But that's the gate we now have in our house. And it clearly separates our space from his, which ironically enough, his space is like three times our space. But I digress. Anyway, so that's the gate. But the gate is a transition place from one place to another. And the Bible describes God's house is the gateway to heaven. So wherever God's house is, there is an access point between these two worlds. And there's a lot of different houses of God that are described in the Bible. Like later on, we get the tabernacle of Moses. And the cool thing about this one is each one of these houses illustrate a certain element of who God is and how his presence dwells. This tabernacle, though, doesn't represent us. It doesn't represent us as a body because it actually all represents Jesus Christ. They have the altar of sacrifice. Jesus bled and died for our sins. There's the altar of incense. He's our intercessor, the candle. He's the light of the world. So this clearly depicts him. The house of God that represents us is this one in Genesis. And there's really no description given here except God was there, his word was there, and there was a gateway to heaven. Right? However, it represents us, and we can say there's no description, but we finally get our description in the life of Jesus. So we're going to go ahead and jump ahead there, and we're going to go to the New Testament, and we're going to go to John chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, I'm going to get really nerdy for a few minutes. Hopefully, you all travel with me down this road. But this is the kind of thing that gets me really excited. Because the Word here, when they say the Word, it's in reference to Jesus. 
But John is doing it in such a creative way, he's actually referencing all the way back to Genesis, not in 28 where we were just at, but like the creation in Genesis where God said, let there be light, let the land come forward. So when they said the word, their concept of this would have been the creative, powerful force of God in the universe. He's brilliant in the way he narrates this. And so what he does is he's saying, Jesus, God's power manifested in human form, came to be with us. And then let's jump down to verse 14, same chapter. It says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word, when he says dwelling here, it actually means tabernacled. It actually means house of God. So the word of God, the creative, powerful force of God in the universe came and represented God's house, the gateway to heaven here on earth, which I find awesome. I think that's really cool. I think it's a cool thing. So he's saying, this is Jesus. And the cool thing is, is Jesus at this time was the only person who represented that. The Holy Spirit hadn't come to all of us. Throughout Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit coming different times, but Jesus had yet to die, so he was the only person with the Holy Spirit within him. However, he tells his disciples that at some point, the Holy Spirit that is upon you will eventually be in you. So Jesus is God's house in his presence. He is the gateway to heaven. And I'll keep showing you. We're going to stay in John chapter 1. We're going to go to verse 43. And it says, the next day, as Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. People like Philip and people, sorry, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nazareth is a very small town, so there's kind of some cynicism. But let me say, how many of us believe that good, powerful, earth-changing things can come from a tiny town? Yeah, yeah right? And all the people from Marion said amen, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, back again. Sorry, I get distracted a lot, but that's okay. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. That's quite a jump. I'm not going to lie. I don't transition in my faces in that quick. Like, who the heck is this guy? Well, I saw you under the fig tree. You're God! <laughs> That's a jump, but we'll just we'll go with it. Anyway, Jesus said, you believe, and I think Jesus was kind of astounded too. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So in the book of Genesis, we have the house of God. We have angels ascending and descending. We have the word of God coming forward to impact the world. And it's the same with Jesus. And I really do think if we can learn to live with an awareness of this, it will drastically impact how we partner with God. Because God has always worked with humans, correct? From the fall in Genesis, all the way through the Bible, all the way to now, he's always partnering with humanity. Because I keep going back to Genesis, but the Bible's one story, so we're going to go back to it again. But if you look at it, in Genesis, we have the fall of man. But prior to that, we have God who, after his creation, and he says, this is good, he gives dominion and rule of this good world to us. And we gave it away. We were deceived, and we were taught in the thinking that we didn't need God, so we give dominion and rule away. But the dominion and rule was still belong to us, so God had to partner with us humans to restore the world. That's the journey through the Old Testament to the New Testament to the death of Christ. And God knew that we of ourselves couldn't do that. We couldn't restore the world. A man had to take it back, however. So the word became flesh and tabernacled, became the gateway to heaven among us and took it back for us. And that's where we're at now. That's our inheritance. So the question that I have is what do we do with this? How often are we actually allowing ourselves 
to be the gateway. Because I ask the question all the time, just like a lot of people do. Like, I grew up in the church, so you hear phrases all the time like, well, where is God in politics? Where is God in these social issues? Where is God in our family? Like, if God would just show up, man, things would work better, right? But the question is, is where is the house of God at? Where is the gateway of heaven at? Essentially, where are we at? God is still looking to partner with us. And now, granted, we have the example through the life of Jesus, but Jesus told his disciples, and through that tells us, that he's going to partner with us the same way. It says, I wasn't following my notes. I've got to catch up here. Almost there. Cool. Let's look at John chapter 14. Where he, Jesus is talking to his disciples about how they will eventually be the gateway to heaven. He says, very truly, starting in verse 12, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So once again, I have to stop there for a minute. Does that blow anybody else's mind? Yeah. This is Jesus saying, you will do the things I've been doing. What, what's he's been doing? He's been healing people. He's been raising people from the dead. He's been mass-producing food with five loaves and two fish. He's been restoring people. He's been lifting up the marginalized. And he says, you will do the things that I have been doing and even greater things. That just continues to blow my mind and continues to raise the bar of expectation of what I should be seeing God do in my life. Anyway, let's go back in. Verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, advocate referring to the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. We're going to jump down a little bit to verse 25. All this I have spoken with while I was with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus was telling his disciples that they would become the gateway to heaven as he was the gateway to heaven. And the cool thing is, is after Jesus died, rose from the dead, and ascended on high, they did it. He's telling all this to 12 guys that were fishermen, which are by our cultural comparisons, basically they were high school dropouts who were finding minimum wage jobs wherever they could. And he's telling these guys, this is what you're going to be. You're going to be the gateway to heaven as I am. And they do it. I'm using a lot of scripture. Huge props to Annette, because she had probably had to put like 200 slides together. So, but we're going to go to Acts chapter 5. They're doing it here. Starting with verse 12, he says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those who were tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. <laughs> it's just so cool, isn't it? So how does a shadow, like other translations of the Bible actually said, so Peter's shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. How does a shadow heal anybody? It doesn't make sense. It's the only comparison I have culturally is Peter Pan. Not real. <laughs> but how does a shadow do that? And I think it's so much so that Peter had had such an impactful experience with Jesus Christ, the gateway to heaven, that he couldn't help but give it off. Yeah. Brennan Manning says this. He's an incredible author. His most famous work is the Ragmuffin Gospel. And he says, in every encounter, we either give life or we drain it. There is no neutral exchange. And we all do this. Like, if I say, think of that person, that as soon as they walk in the room, it just seems like the spirit and the energy lifts. 
You just feel better because they're there. Whatever you're working on or doing or a party, you're glad that person's there because it just lights up the room. You probably know exactly who comes to mind at that moment. Well, at the same time, if I say, think of that person that as soon as they walk in the room, it seems just like the light's turned off. They just bring that negativity with them. And we all do that. We all give off of what our experiences are. Which is why I believe that the God, in those scriptures, it says, taste and see that God is good. Because we have to taste it, we have to fully experience it. We can't be an effective gateway to heaven unless we have fully experienced the power, the hope, the healing, the restoration, the joy that comes from fully experiencing the power of heaven in our lives. This last week, I, uh, like I said, we went to Traverse City for our fourth wedding anniversary. And we don't spend a lot of money on food typically, but once a year we will just spend stupid amount of money on a meal. Because it's our anniversary. So we went to this restaurant, and I was looking through the menu, and they had a burger that was ground filet mignon with a crab cake on top of it with a lobster tail on top of it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm getting this burger. And it was awesome. Yeah. Truly awesome. It was way too expensive, but it was worth it. However, the next day, as we were getting ready to go home, we just stopped at some random place to eat, and they had burgers on the menu. Didn't have lobster tail. <laughs> but because I had experienced what was truly good, anything that was less just wasn't worth it. So if we are not truly pressing into we experience that, how can we give off of it? We have to be hungry for it. I heard Bill Johnson, who is the pastor at Bethel out in Redding, California, he said, we can seldom get from the kingdom what we're not hungry for. And if we're not hungry to press into his presence, we can't be his presence in the world. Now, a lot of this stuff, I have to say, I've got to experience a lot of different things that we've talked about today. I've actually got to see people be healed. Like, seriously cool. I've got to see families restored. I've got to be a part of organizations that come up and you're like, man, God is surely in this place. But at those times, I was really honestly on my game at those times. Like, I was really spending a lot of time in the scriptures. I was spending all the rest of my time, like, watching YouTube videos of pastors and listening to podcasts and spending a lot of time in my community of people who really were pressing into God as much as they possibly could. And I got to see fantastic things. But no shock to any of you, I'm also human, and I'm not always on my game. And there's times I just don't want to press in. Like everybody else, when I'm hurting even though the thing I need to do is get on my face at the cross and be like, hey, restore me. The last thing I want to do is do that. Like, I'd rather play Assassin's Creed on my Xbox. <laughs> I'm being real. But those are the moments we need to truly ask for that hunger. We need to truly ask that God would just explode his presence on us so that we can continue to be that presence. To harken back to what DJ talked about a couple weeks ago, that's a perfect time to get some people around you to hold your arms up. It happened for me this morning. Honestly, I, like, I love teaching. It's one of my favorite things to do. But this morning I got here and I was like, I don't know if I want to. I've had a lot of crap going on in my life the last couple of weeks. And I was like, I just don't know if I have it. But Megan at the end of leadership services said, like, hey, TJ's preaching this morning. Can some of you come and pray for him? And they don't know what's going on in my life. But as they put their hands on me and prayed for me, thank you, Jamie, Tom, and Seth, I felt just peace being renewed in me. And honestly, a hunger being renewed in me like, yeah, this is what we get to do. Those are the times we go and get around people like, guys, I'm not hungry right now. I don't want to be hungry right now. I need you to raise my arms up. Just like Moses did. Because we all fight those battles and we need to get those people around us because we can't be a gateway unless we've experienced it ourselves. So let me just ask you guys this. Are you hungry this morning? Are you truly hungry to experience the fullness of heaven exploding in your life to see it then explode all over your world around you? I'm going to leave it with that this morning. But I'm going to pray, and as if you want to come to the altar, feel free. But I'm going to pray, and just if you are wanting more of that hunger for his presence...
If you are wanting more of his presence to be just a gateway through your life, as I pray, just say yes. Just say yes to God, because I guarantee you with 100% certainty, God has more for you than what you're currently experiencing. You might be rocking it out. I still guarantee you with 100% certainty, God has more for you. I believe it for me. I believe it for all of us. So as we pray this morning, just say yes. God, I want to be hungry. God, I want to experience more. I want more of you to come out of my life. Okay? Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. And we experience you and who you are in this place. And Lord God, I ask that you would meet us here in this place in such a way that we are so impacted that we can't help but give it off to everyone we meet. Lord God, we want, we want the power in our lives of shadows that restore people. And Lord God, we just say yes. You said you will work in us. You said you've given us the advocate, your Holy Spirit, who will do even greater things than you did. Like, my gosh. And we just say, yes, we want it. We just say that we want to see the people's lives around us restored because you're working through us. And God, for those of us who have just had moments where just we just don't want it, we just aren't hungry, we don't even know how to be, I ask that right now, that for me and every one of us here, that you would put people in our heads and in our minds right now that like, hey, I need to go get by them because they can hold my arms up in this. Lord God, I ask that you would meet people where they're at right now and just create a fire that can't be quenched by anything but you, Lord Jesus. And I declare this over this people, this church, and this community that we hunger for you and we expect to see your house, God's house, as a gateway to heaven that will just pour out the power of your presence on Grant County and spread it so much further. Holy Father, we love you. We praise you and we give you thanks that you are doing this and we can have that expectation, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray, Lord God. Amen. Thanks, guys.